Hey guys, how are we doing? I'm tired. I am ready for the weekend. It's coming, right? Got a joke for you, okay? Good joke now. So there's all this debate about, um, I just dropped my papers, hang on. There's all this debate, you know, during uh, the coronavirus thing, you know, that we shouldn't make light of it, shouldn't tell jokes about it, shouldn't laugh about it, right? So, what kind of joke can you tell during coronavirus? An inside joke. <laughs> That's a good one. Inside joke. Get it? Alright. Good job. We need to do more jokes. I'm going to try to think of more jokes to put on the videos. Okay. Here we go. Um, a little bit of review. Approximately when did the Cold War end? The late 1980s. Hopefully you have your notes out and you're following along here. Um, what brought an end to the Cold War? The people were sick of what? Communist tyranny. Who was the American president who was a strong anti-communist? Ronald Reagan. Who was the premier of the Soviet Union who was a soft, a much softer communist? Mikhail Gorbachev. Um... What do we call the event that happened in Cuba where the Soviet Union was trying to arm missiles in Cuba that could reach the United States? And that was where the world came the closest to having a nuclear war. The Cuban Missile Crisis. What was the term for people thinking that the Russians were way ahead of us when it came to missile technology? Missile gap. Um, what was the competition to get to space and have space technology? Uh, the soonest or to be, to be the most advanced with space technology? It's called the space race. Uh, what about the race to get better weapons? It's called the arms race. And the arms race brought what? Fear and tension. There was this policy where we believe that if anybody started a nuclear war, that you know, if they started, we would wipe them out. If we started, they would wipe us out. And this is called mutually assured destruction. Okay, the fear of the domino effect caused wars in what two places? Korea, Vietnam. Um, what was the thing where in the city of Berlin uh, we sent airplanes in to keep the city of Berlin supplied while the Russians had it had it separated off from the rest of the world? They they cut off the supply lines. What was that called? Berlin airlift. Yes. Okay. All right. So that was in regard to the Cold War. Today we're going to learn about the 1960s peace. Peace, brother. Peace out. Peace, man. Peace, love. I'm trying to read this backwards. Rainbows and bell bottoms. The 1960s. What an interesting time, right? Were any any of your parents alive during the 1960s? If they were. You need to ask them about it, okay? Ask them what they remember. Ask them what their opinion is of the 1960s. Why were the 1960s so significant? Because most people agree that there was this radical transformation that happened in our country during the 1960s. We started the 1960s one way, we came out of the 1960s a completely different country. There was this radical transformation. It was a time of a lot of, a lot of, a lot of upheaval, a lot of 
things were going on. And um, it was a very interesting time. So we're going to talk about it. So to kind of get, set the background a little bit, what do you have going on? Yesterday we talked or last, last lesson we talked about the Cold War, right? What was one of the major violent outbreaks that took place during the Cold War? Even though the Cold War itself wasn't a war, there were two wars that came out of it, right? One was the Vietnam War, okay? The Vietnam War was going on in the 1960s. So that was part of the problem, all right? Um, people were scared, right? There was a lot of fear because of, because of, because of uh, fear that was taking place during the during the uh, Cold War, you know, mutually assured destruction. If, if we launch a missile, the Russians are going to wipe us out. If they launch a missile, we're going to wipe them out. Gonna, if one missile is launched, it's going to just cause this huge, massive nuclear holocaust, and millions of people are going to die. All right, so there's a lot of fear, a lot of tension, racial tension. And people getting angry and uh, upset at those that are in authority because they don't like the decisions that the government is making. A lot of that had to do, again, with the Vietnam War and what was going on there. People were sick and tired of it. People were sick and tired of, of racism. And, and this whole movement came out of it. It was just the 60s, right? So we're going to talk about it. All right. So what were some of the characteristics of the 60s? What were some of the things that came out of the 60s? Uh, some inventions, some things that went on. So you had a lot of economic prosperity. So economically, it was a good time to be alive, right? A lot of opportunities to you know, make money, start businesses, things like that. Good time, right? Travel became a bigger thing in the 60s. Now, it started before the 60s and the 1950s is when, uh, I think it was, uh, I can't remember which president, but um, put forward the Interstate Commerce Act or something to that effect, where we actually built interstate highways, okay? It's only been about 60 or 70 years that we've had, maybe 80 years, that we've had interstate highways. What are interstate highways? You guys know, right? When you go back east, you get on the interstate, right? Interstate 70, maybe sometimes you go up to 80. Um, interstate 25 goes through Pueblo and uh, Colorado Springs, Denver. It goes all up to Wyoming, all the way to the Canadian border, all the way down to, I don't know, Mexican border maybe. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, interstate highways are highways that connect the states, all right? All the other roads are kind of more local. Right? So the other roads within the states are kind of the responsibility of the states. But the interstates, the interstate highways are highways that connect the states, and they are um, they're the responsibility of the federal government, I believe, if I understand that correctly. Now, it doesn't mean that other roads don't go into other states. They do, but often when they do, they change their name. Have you ever noticed that? So if you're not on an interstate and you cross from Colorado into Kansas, the road number might change. Now, not necessarily. So we have like uh, Route 50, which stays 50 all the way across the United States of America. So I'm not sure why some do and some don't. I don't know how that works. But anyway, interstates made it possible to travel much more quickly, um, get places, you know, you can go faster. There's not, you know, red lights, at least not near. I don't think there is red lights on interstates. Is there? Is there ever red lights on interstates? I don't think so. Anyway, so there's not as much stopping and starting, and, and you can get places, right? Travel. Along with that, people started to do things like go camping. Uh, the RV industry started to take off. Um, actually, Mrs. Weaver's great uncle, I uh, can't remember his name, but he started the RV company called Jayco. So if you see Jayco campers, Jayco uh, motorhomes and all that, that was started by Mrs. Weaver's great uncle. Okay, um, I think his I think his middle name was Jay. That's where the J came from. I'm not sure what his first name was. His last name was like Bontrager or something like that. So he's probably related to Grace too. So anyway, but anyway, and he died in a plane crash. It's an interesting story. There's a book about it. Sorry, little rabbit trail there. But anyway, RVs started to become a thing. Camping started to become a thing. 
traveling, all of that, right? Um, you have the uh, development of the Boeing 747 jumbo jet. So this big, huge, massive airplane that can carry hundreds of people across the ocean, uh, makes travel more, more affordable and so forth. Um, you have the dawn of the information age, all right? Computers start to become a thing. Uh, the basic computer language is written. Now, I don't really know what that is, but somehow computers use a language of some sort. The people who really, really know computers, I mean, not just, you know, how to download stuff and do stuff today, but people who really, really know how computers work, this is the kind of thing that they know about, the basic computer language. Okay? Video games were invented in the 1960s. Bad 1960s. I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, com the computer mouse was invented in the 1960s. Um, LED lights, soft contact lenses. So those of you that wear contacts, you can be thankful for the 60s. Um, audio cassettes. Has any have any of you ever listened to an audio cassette tape? If you haven't, you need to do it. It's what I used to listen to music on. Okay, you pop in the cassette tape, push the button, and you hear this little yeah, and then it would start up the music, right? And if you wanted to go to the next song, you had to push the fast forward, and you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. you finally get to the next song, and, you and if you weren't, you had you didn't know if you were there yet. You didn't, you couldn't just push a button, right? And it would go to the next one, so you had to stop it. And, you're still playing the last song, so you go a little farther and then stop it and finally get to the right spot and listen to your song. Okay? Cassette tapes. And every now and then you'd be listening to one all of a sudden and it would quick get it out and, and, and it would mean that the cassette player was eating the tape and all that little tape stuff and going all through it and it was your favorite tape and it, ah, so aggravating because then you had to try to fix it and wind it back up and usually even if you got it wound back up it never quite sounded as good as it did before but anyway cassette tapes um cd this is interesting to me compact discs cds were invented in the 1960s you guys ever listen to cds i mean they're still around you can still buy them they're still out there right um kind of rare but uh they were invented in the 1960s not long after the cassettes but the, uh, the cassettes became popular, like, I think in the 80s, and then CDs didn't really become popular until the 90s. So it takes time after something is invented for it to actually become popular, right? Uh, the barcode scanner was invented in the uh, 60s. Um, calculators, the 911 emergency telephone system started in the 60s. Microwave oven started in the 60s. Again, didn't really get all that popular until probably more like the 70s or 80s. I remember my parents buying their first microwave oven. I remember it. I know. I'm ancient. I'm ancient. I know. We actually don't have a microwave at our house right now. The house we're moving into in about a week and a half has a microwave, but we don't have one. We were trying to get away from that. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna have one again. Oh well, big deal. Um, and the first heart transplant was in the 1960s. Okay? So a bunch of stuff going on in the 1960s. It was an important time. Uh, a lot of, you know, developments, inventions, um, a lot of good things. However, there was also some things that were fairly troubling that took place during the 1960s as well. Let's talk about some of the things that took place. So. Um, you had a lot of issues of racism. Okay, racism. Ever since the Civil War, the slaves had been freed, so you didn't have slavery anymore. But slaves were oppressed. They didn't have equal rights. They weren't given the same rights as white people, right? And finally, and, and, and well, over time, slowly, more and more black people were demanding to have equal rights, right? And it became this movement that slowly built up steam and became stronger and stronger, and in the 1960s, it just kind of exploded. Okay? Big time. Um, and uh, it, it had a lot of uh, tension and violence. My chalk just disintegrated in my hand. 
<laughs> Sorry, Ryan. Did I scare you? Get a new piece. We're good. <clears throat> All right. A lot of tension and violence. Speaking of tension and violence, yeah. Throwing chalk across the room. We're good. All right. Um, so, yeah, there were riots. There were race riots. There were um, marches. Just a lot of, a lot of just tension. Okay. Um, and who was the guy? Does anybody know who was the guy who led the charge when it came to um, the push for racial equality? Who was the guy in the 1960s? Anybody know? Martin. So now, Luther King Jr. Okay, Martin Luther King Jr. He was a he was a black man, and he was a leader of the uh, he was a leader of the equal rights movement. Okay, he played a big part in pushing to get blacks the same equality as white people. Um, he believed in nonviolence. Okay, Martin Luther King did not partake. He did not get involved in violence. He didn't go out and you know fight and you know he didn't do that. He everything he did was nonviolent. So they would do marches in the streets. They would wave signs. They would do protests, you know, like uh, there was this gal named Rosa Parks who refused to sit in the black section in the bus. Or no, I think it was she. No, no, she she refused to stand up and give a white person her seat because that's what black people were supposed to do. If, if you were a black person and you were in a bus and you were sitting, and a white person came in and there was no seat for the white person, you were supposed to stand up and let the white person sit down. Right? And Rosa Parks refused to do that and caused a big issue. She went to jail, I think, for it. But that's the kind of thing that Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. promoted. Okay, he didn't want violence; he just wanted protest. Right? He wanted to use peaceful means, and it was fairly effective. Now, unfortunately, they were not always met with peaceful means. Um, especially in Birmingham, Alabama, there was a police chief. And I can't remember his name, but he was famous for the things that he did to. The black protesters. So he would bring out fire trucks and mow them down with fire hoses. Like, you know how much water comes out of a fire hose? And they would just like, they would shoot the fire hoses into these crowds of black people to knock them down. They would sick these big, powerful German shepherd dogs on them and things like that. So yeah, it was a rough time. Rough time. A lot of racism, a lot of racial tension. Um, and then there was another guy, and, and I don't have his name written down, but um, his name was Malcolm X. He was another leader of the civil rights movement, um, and he did believe in violence. Okay, he did. So there were some some black people that believed that they should try to gain their rights through violent means. Um, another thing that came uh, out of the 1960s was environmentalism. Up until then, people didn't have a lot of concern about the environment. Um, and this guy wrote a book that got a lot of popularity, and people decided we better start taking care of the environment. And actually, in that case, in that situation, she was probably right, and that is probably good that environmentalism, to a certain degree, did start. Now, I know that we've taken it way overboard. People have gone way overboard with the whole environmentalist movement and agenda. It's become basically a religion where people worship the environment. Um, and that's not good. But initially, we did need a correction. You know, people were being too uh, unconcerned about caring for the environment. And, and, you know, God gave us creation, and we are supposed to take care of it, right? So environmentalism was one thing that came out of it. Um, there were also numerous famous assassinations that happened in the 1960s, okay? Um, does anybody know who, who were some people who were assassinated in the 1960s? John F. Kennedy. Okay. Now, 
Now, JFK was an interesting guy. He was a Democrat, but he was actually a pretty good president. I mean, he, you know, the thing is, Democrats today are way more liberal than John F. Kennedy. So he campaigned on hope and promise, and he would say things like, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. That's actually a really good statement, right? Ask what you can do for your country, not what your country can do for you. That's more like a Republican thing than a Democrat, at least nowadays. But anyway, um, so, you know, he became president and he did a lot of, a lot of things that were, I mean, in a lot of ways, probably good for the country. He inspired morale. He stood up to communism. Um, and a lot of people had a lot of hope and confidence in JFK. And what happens to him? Pow. He gets assassinated. Right? He gets killed. I know there's a lot of conspiracy, but supposedly a guy shot him from a window while he was going through a parade in Texas. And, um, and uh, I think it was the next day that guy was being transported to prison or something. And while he's being transported on live television, another guy steps out of the crowd and shoots him. So the guy who at least supposedly assassinated Kennedy was killed like a day later on live TV. And there's a lot of people who say it wasn't really him, it was all a conspiracy. I don't know. You can uh, look into that if you want. All right, so John F. Kennedy was assassinated, but what a lot of people don't know was that a few years later, John F. Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, was also assassinated. Okay. Um, Robert Kennedy was running for president. He was running for the Democratic ticket. And once again, there was a lot of enthusiasm behind him. He was, you know, he had the Kennedy name. John F. Kennedy had been an extremely popular president. And Robert was well on his way to getting the Democratic nomination. And he probably would have become president because people liked him. People wanted him. He had a lot of momentum. But while he was campaigning, he was assassinated. All right. Um, Martin Luther. I'm just going to put MLK. This guy, okay. Martin Luther King Jr. is shot and killed. All right. So he is assassinated. And I mentioned Malcolm X, the other uh, civil rights leader, was also assass assassinated. Okay. So just a lot of like. Violence, right? And then somebody rises up and tries to bring hope, and boom, they get shot too, right? And that just that just caused so much like turmoil. And, and you know, when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, it causes more racial violence and, and all this stuff. So it's just a bad time in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, there were some good things, but a lot of uh, a lot of things that. Um, we're scared. So there was a lot of violence in the 1960s. And what kind of violence are we talking about? Well, um, there were racial protests. Again, black people protesting for their rights, and some of them became violent. The black people were not all innocent. Some of them did some really um, atrocious things. And there were also a lot of anti-war protests. And, um, you know, again, people were so sick and tired of what was going on in Vietnam. They were, you know, there's already this tension with Russia. We're afraid that we're going to get nuked. And then the Vietnam War starts and all this stuff happens. We start getting these reports back from Vietnam about all this bloodshed and we're not getting anywhere, we're not winning, we're just, you know, we're shooting innocent people, we're destroying villages, we're, we're kind of the bad guys, and, and people are sick of it. And so there's all this anti-war sentiment that rises up and people start to, you know, people start to protest. And I don't know how much it actually led to actual violence except in one situation I think there was a there was a protest happening at Kent State University in Ohio, 
And it got so bad that the National Guard actually started shooting into the crowd and killed four people. Okay, this is America, right? And that happened in America. Um, anyway, um, another thing that happened during this time is Israel became a nation. And this is interesting because all these things are happening. Nuclear warfare is kind of scarily on the horizon. People are afraid that it's, we're going to have nuclear holocaust. Um, there's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's violence, there's upheaval. And then Israel becomes a nation, and a lot of people think that that has to do with the end times, you know, Israel becoming a nation. It depends what, you know, theological persuasion you come from or what you believe about the end times and so forth. But a lot of people believe that Israel becoming, becoming a nation was, was like this crucial part of the end times. And so a lot of people thought, this is it. We're almost there. It's, it's, we are, in fact, I think in one of his sermons, Billy Graham said that, uh, I think he said that, I mean, his daughter was, trying to remember the circumstances, but he said something to the effect that he doesn't think his daughter is going to be able to go to college because he thinks Jesus is going to come back before then or something to that. I can't remember how it was exactly, but it was something to that effect. It was just this strong sentiment among Christians that we're almost at the end. Okay? Um... Uh, another important thing that happens in the 60s is you have Apollo 11 lands on the moon. We put human beings on the moon. Neil Armstrong, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, right? This incredible, incredible accomplishment. We sent human beings to the moon. That's phenomenal. That is really phenomenal. And that happened way back in the 60s. And all of that technology that it took to get somebody to the moon had tremendous, a tremendous impact. Do you know how many things came out of that? How much technology has just exploded because of the uh, technological advancements and the discoveries that were made? in the process of getting somebody to the moon. That, the space race had a huge impact on why today we have so much technology, okay? Um, what else? There started to be this major anti-authority sentiment during the 60s. So again, this had to do with People not trusting government leaders. Decisions that were made by the most powerful, most important people in the world. You know, um, Vietnam and, and all these other things started to, you know, were taking place. And young people were like, we don't trust these guys anymore. Okay? And it was just kind of this general sentiment of a lack of trust for people in authority. And it carried over, not just to government people, but to their parents and to the older generation. There was a strong rebellion against the way things were. So we talked about this in the 1920s, okay? There was, that movement took place in the 1920s where, where young people were rebelling against authority. Well, this is happening again, but this time it's much worse. It's like the 1920s on steroids. People were like, we are sick and tired of doing things the way we've always done them. We're sick and tired of our parents telling us what to do, what we should wear, how we should live, how we should dress. Again, women, it was a big thing for women. You know, feminism kind of starts up again. Women don't want to be suppressed. But again, it, it takes a, a new and very sinister form this time. You know, the 1920s had some, had some issues. The 1960s really took it to a new level. Okay, um, so this is when drugs start really becoming a thing. Uh, you know, I, there was drugs before that, but 
it, it seems that the drugs were hidden a lot more, you know, they were kind of kept under wraps a lot better. You didn't do drugs quite as quickly before the 1960s. But in the 1960s became a time where it was like, you know what? There was, there was a sort of a sentiment that the world was going to end soon anyway. Right? Whether you were a Christian or a non-Christian, you were, you lived under this constant threat of nuclear annihilation. So it was like, let's just live it up. Okay? While we're here, let's just get high. Right? So drugs became a thing. Young people started taking drugs and, and it felt really good, right? Drugs feel good. That's why people take it. Um, and so that became a thing. Uh, and we have something called the sexual revolution. Okay, and this is a major, major transformation in the way people think about sexual morality. The reason Hollywood movies, entertainment, the, the reason those things are full of illicit sex and immorality and hooking up and men cheating on their wives and, you know, teenagers having sex before marriage and all of that stuff started. I shouldn't say it started. You know, it's, it's always been around ever since, ever since, you know, ever since the fall of man, right? But, it became much in in the American culture. In the American culture, it became much more prevalent because you know American to a certain America to a certain degree was built on you know Christian ideals, right? The sort of a Puritan ideal, um, and so there was always this sort of sense of biblical morale. You know, sexuality is for marriage, one man, one woman. Um, divorce was frowned on, you know, it happened, but it was frowned on. And, uh, you were, if you were a husband, you were expected to care for your wife and raise your kids. If you're a wife, you're supposed to be faithful to your husband and all of that until the 1960s. And at that point, it was like, you know what? We're tired of living that way. We don't think it should be that. Way. So it was all about celebrating the human body and having as much pleasure as you possibly could in any way that you wanted, as long as it was between consenting adults. There's no restrictions. Let's just live it up, right? And sexual morality took a major plunge off the cliff in the 1960s, okay? Um, there was a big push for peace. Okay, so you see the peace symbol, right? The circle with the Y thing in the middle. That was big in the 1960s. Right? People would paint it on their weird little minivan things that they would drive around. They paint, you know, pink and orange and all these different colors and, you know, world peace and the peace symbol and all these things. Everybody was peace, peace, peace. Now, that's actually kind of a good thing, right? Peace, right? They would sing songs like, um, last night I had the strangest dream I ever dreamed before. I dreamed that all the world agreed to put an end to war. Terrell is just cringing right now. I can just see him just cringing. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing they sang about peace. They called for peace. They marched for peace. They held banners for peace. Not a bad thing, right? We want peace. Peace is a good thing. Okay? So that was one of the things in the 60s that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It was just <laughs> a lot of the things that went with it, you know? Along with peace, we want to be able to live however we want. We want to be able to have, uh, you know, multiple sexual partners whenever we want. We want to be able to take drugs and just have this wonderful, pleasuresome life experience any way we possibly can. 
that also went along with that whole peace attitude, right? So there was some good, there was a lot of bad. All right. Um, Uh, another thing uh, that went along with the hippies is uh, rock music. So rock music is kind of a hippie thing. It's a new style of music that comes out. Um, you have guys like, uh, anybody know? Who were some of the original rock musicians? The, the guys who made rock music famous. And this wasn't hard rock, but we have now with like guys just screaming their lungs out and pounding on their guitars. It was very different when it started. Um, who were they? Uh, guys like Elvis, Presley, right? Y'all heard of him? Heard of Elvis Presley? Okay. Um, it was a very popular band from Great Britain, the United Kingdom, and what were they called? The Beatles. Okay, yes. Um, another group that was popular was called the Jackson Five. Anybody ever heard of them? Maybe not, but you probably have heard of a guy named Michael Jackson. Okay, the Jackson Five was for five brothers who started a rock band in the 1960s. They were extremely popular. And uh, one of them, I think it was the youngest one, Michael Jackson, who also who eventually went solo and was massively popular. But his life was full of controversy, heartache, misery, and eventually he died. And I think it was because of possibly suicide. I don't remember for sure, or an overdose of some sort. And that was the sad thing. A lot of these guys, their lives ended tragically. Elvis Presley died of an overdose. Again, there's a lot of like conspiracy theories about his death too. You know, he probably just was, you know, he had the world by the tail. He was the most famous entertainer in the world. And he committed suicide, right? Um, the Beals, uh, one of their guys was actually killed, was shot to death in the 1980s, so another assassination. It didn't happen in the 1960s, uh, it happened in the 80s. Um, but John Lennon was, was shot to death in, I think, in New York City. Um, there's still, I think there's one or two of the Beatles that is still alive today. Paul McCartney is one of them. He still sings, sang at the Super Bowl, uh, like 10 years ago or something. But anyway, he's getting pretty old. He was old then. So anyway, he's really old. But, yeah, so those are some of them. There was other groups with weird names like The Who, The Animals, and The Kinks. So all kinds of... Music was a big thing in the 60s. Um, rock music, it was this different. It was this new genre. It was a genre that was challenging the status quo. They were, they were using a different style of music, a different beats, different things, and it was, it was, it was all part of this pushback against authority and against... Um, the way things were, right? Uh, anyway, so rock music in the 60s. Now, interestingly, and, and here's a little here's a little twist that's pretty fascinating, okay? Because you have all these people, these hippies, these these people who who their life philosophy is get as much as you can out of life, have as much have as many good times as you can, right? Stop fighting, stop the violence, stop the wars, just have peace and love and drugs and sex and all this, you know, let's just let's just let's just have as much pleasure in life as we possibly can. That was the mentality of the hippie movement in the 60s, okay? But here's what happened to some of those people. Because when you live your life that way, what happens? You eventually realize that that kind of a life is extremely, extremely empty. Meaningless. You know, eventually there's just not enough drugs. 
to cover the pain. There's not enough drugs to keep you happy all the time. Okay? There's not enough sexual immorality to keep you satisfied. And eventually you just get to this point where you are empty. Okay? And there became amongst many of these hippies this longing for purpose. Longing for something greater. Longing for something better. And out of that we had something that I think overall was a good thing. And once again, there were some things about it that weren't always great. But overall, I think it was a good thing. And we call it the Jesus movement. Okay? The Jesus movement. And these are basically hippies who decide Jesus is the answer, right? In fact, I think that's where that song came from. Jesus is the answer. That's where it came from, I believe, was, was that movement, right? And there became sort of this, this miniature revival that sprung up from within the hippie movement, where hippies were saying, we want Jesus. We want to serve him. We want to live for him. Now, a lot of them were very immature Christians, and a lot of the things that they did often were like, you know, a lot of the more mature Christians were kind of scratching their heads. And a lot of people were critical and judgmental of them, and, you know, I get it. They were they were immature Christians, and, you know, when things like that happen, you're going to have some things that are maybe always great. Um, so, you know, you can find things in the Jesus movement that were not great, but you can also find some things that were very encouraging. Okay. And a lot of things that came out of the Jesus movement have impacted us even today and in church and evangelical life even today. Again, some of it may not be good, but some of it maybe is good. Okay. Um, and out of the Jesus movement, we get the contemporary Christian. Music movements, right? So these hippies, they love music, right? They love their rock music. And some of them are musicians. And when they become Christians, what do they do? Do they just stop being musicians or just start singing hymns like, oh, I don't know, amazing. You know, you know they don't do that. They keep on being rock musicians, right? But instead of writing rock music the way they used to write it, they start writing Christian rock. Okay, um, and that's where the contemporary Christian music movement was birthed. That's where it started. Um, uh, one very important character in the Jesus movement was a guy named Chuck Smith. He was a pastor in California, and he was very influential in the Jesus movement. Um, and again, a lot of these guys uh, that came out of the Jesus movement were musicians, and that's where contemporary Christian music came from. Who were some of those early musicians? And you need to ask your parents if they know these people's names. They may not know all of them, but I about guarantee they will know some of them. All right? Keith Green. Keith Green was an extremely popular Christian musician, a committed, passionate Christian, actually died in a plane crash. But he wrote songs like, Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Aren't you guys just loving how much you get to hear Mr. Weaver sing today? It's like amazing. You thought you were just going to have to watch a lecture? And you get to hear me sing like five times, right? Okay, uh, Keith Green. Um, Petra. Ask your parents if they've ever heard of Petra. There's a higher place to go beyond belief, beyond belief. There you go. Another one. Number six. All right. Another group called Second Chapter of Acts. I won't sing any of their songs. Um, a guy named Larry Norman. 
I'm not sure. I haven't hardly ever listened to him. He was actually sort of a controversial character who came out later that he was actually living a fairly immoral lifestyle behind the scenes, even though he was a quote-unquote Christian musician. Um, but he wrote a popular song called, Why Should the Devil Have All the Good Music? Right? It was, you know, trying to make the argument that rock music just shouldn't be bad, but it can be good. <laughs> anyway, um, that's Larry Norman and uh, a gal named Amy Green. And you may have heard of her, your parents, I'm sure they've heard of her. Um, she's actually, you know, she's, well, most of these guys are slow. Keith Green died, I think Larry Norman died, the rest of them I think are still alive. Um, they're just not as popular. Amy Grant actually may still be semi-popular, uh, but she was massively popular at one time. Uh, but yeah, a lot of songs that we sing today, a lot of like the simple praise choruses like, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and I love you, Lord. A lot of those choruses came from this movement. Now, we're talking about the 1960s, and, and the Jesus movement and contemporary Christian music really didn't come until the 1970s, mainly, maybe a bit in the 1960s, but mainly the 1970s. But I wanted to talk about it because it was an offshoot. It, it, it came out of the hippie movement, and I wanted to put that together. Um, but yeah, a lot of popular praise choruses. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Um, you know, a lot of these songs that we still sing today, just these simple songs. And, and, and that kind of characterized sort of what the Jesus movement was about. Because it was a lot of these guys, they were, they were longing for purpose. They were longing for something better than drugs and immorality and the pleasure that the world had to offer. They, they wanted something more. And they even admit they didn't always do it right. And there were, there were some theological systems and some doctrinal systems and some teaching that came out of the Jesus movement that was not very good and not very helpful. But at the same time, there was also just a lot of people who just, they just had a longing for Jesus. A longing to serve him. And so they would write these simple, powerful praise choruses that still resonate with us today, at least some of them. And we still sing them, As the Deer, um, and some of those other ones. Uh, so anyway, that was the Jesus movement. You know, so even, even when people are turning against God, turning their backs on him, even in that, it's, it's so amazing how God can come down and work in spite of that, but also sort of because of that, he uses the emptiness and the darkness to show people their need for him. Okay? So anyway, the 60s. Um, let's, uh, let's finish up quickly. What was the impact of the 60s? What was the impact of the 60s? So, the positives. Was there good things that came out of the 60s? Yes, there were. Okay, let's, let's you know, be honest about that, right? Um, there were some good things. There was, you know, racial equality. Because of some of the things that happened in the 60s, black people got a lot more um, rights, okay? The, the, just, even though there was a lot of violence and a lot of bad things and MLK was assassinated and, and a lot of troubling racial things happened in the 60s, you know, because of all of that, it got people's attention, it got the attention of the politicians, and some good things came out of that. And so black people got better racial equality. Um, there was a distaste for unnecessary war and 
violence. Okay? People were so sick and tired of war and violence. And that's not a bad thing, right? We don't, you know, we don't want to go out and kill unnecessarily. We don't want to start bloody wars that don't accomplish anything. So people started to push back against that. Instead of the, you know, kind of radical patriotic, let's go get them, let's kill them. It's more like, no, we got to be careful. We got to make sure we know what we're doing before we rush into war, right? Um, and also concern for the environment. And I say that as a good thing because I do think it was a good thing. You know, we needed a corrective in that area. If we would have continued going down the road we were going down, we might have messed this world up in a way that would have been hard to fix, right? And so um, a certain amount of environmental concern is a good thing. I've been to Romania, and in Romania they don't have the same kind of environmental concern as we do. And when you're in the city, there's this horrible smell that just permeates the city. Like it's, you know, the pollution is just horrible. I don't want to live in a world like that. I don't want to live in a country that has that kind of pollution, right? I mean, if God called me there to be a missionary, yes, yeah, so obviously. But, but you know what I mean. Like, we don't want pollution. Um, and again, we, I, you know, I know, the environmental movement is going off the deep end crazy to the degree that it's not very helpful anymore. But initially, that was a good concern. Um, Negatives. A complete transformation in morality. Okay. Um, moral uh, standards just being vaporized, destroyed. All right, people being unconcerned about sexual immorality becoming prevalent. And so let's put down um, the popularization of drugs. And the normalization of sexual promiscuity. Okay, so it, it didn't just it, it didn't just make sexual immorality um, more rampant. It made it more normal. Just like it's okay. People tried to make the argument that it was okay, and today we're suffering the effects of that. Right? Divorce, out of wedlock, pregnancies, um, just all kinds of brokenness, broken homes, broken. Sexuality, it's just a mess uh, because of this, right? Um, and this general rebellion against authority. Sorry if my handwriting is really bad. Rebellion against authority. Now, it's not that authority should never be questioned. You know, there were some things that happened in the 60s with government leaders and so forth that they, they needed to be held accountable for, right? Somebody needed to stand up and say, why do we keep sending troops to Vietnam when we're not getting anywhere? We're just causing massive bloodshed. You know, somebody needed to stand up and ask those questions, right? But when this leads to just this overall complete distrust of anyone in authority, that's not good. Okay? We need to have respect for those in authority. Parents, teachers, police officers, we need to respect authority. Again, not that it can never be questioned, not that there's never any accountability for those people, obviously, but there needs to be respect for authority. So, 
the 60s, were they good? Were they bad? What do you think? You know, was it a good time? Again, there were some good things. Um, but as Christians, I think we look at that time and we, and we realize that there were some massive moral transformations that took place that give us great concern. But it doesn't have to make us, like, angry or discouraged. Really, it's an opportunity. Because just like those hippies got to the point where they felt hopeless, there are a lot of people today who have kind of followed that same mentality that came from the 60s. Um, there's still people today with that same kind of philosophy. You know, let's just make the most of life. Have as much joy or as much, not joy, but as much pleasure as you can get any way you can get it. No restrictions, no moral boundaries. And eventually that just becomes really empty, right? And so as Christians, we can give those people an answer and give them a hope when they come to that point in their lives where they realize this world just doesn't cut it. All those quote-unquote wonderful things that I thought I would experience when I started living a life completely unrestricted by moral boundaries, when I realized that that just doesn't give me what I thought it was going to give me, maybe I'll start looking for something better. And that's where we as Christians can come in. Okay? So the 1960s transformed our country drastically. But you know, we should expect that because we live in a fallen world. But Jesus still is the answer. He still is the hope, the gospel, what people need. So let's shine the light of the gospel to people who have bought into the lie that this kind of mentality can give you purpose, right? Let's shine the light of the gospel to those people. Because Jesus is the answer. All right, guys. Have a great weekend. I don't know when you're watching this. Maybe you're already on the weekend. That's all I got. Adios.